uh, so Shamima Zad, as you probably know, she's a poet, storyteller, teacher and writer. She was born in Bangladesh. In 1990, she came to the UK as a teacher and she has been writing since 1970. Her works has been published, among others, in The New Yorker and she has published 37 books in English and Bangla. She likes to compile and produce anthologies, run workshops on oral histories for publication. Shamim has received many recognitions from Bangladesh and the UK, including residency with the Poets Agora in Athens 2019 and the Artist in the Community Award by the National Lottery in 2020 in the UK. She is a trustee of The Rich Mix, EC member of Exiled Writers Inc., founder chair of BSK, with the World Literature Centre, London branch, uh, BBPC, British Bidding Web Poetry Collective, and P. Joy Pool, forgive my pronunciation, an intergenerational storytelling initiative for 1971, the movement of independence of Bangladesh. Thank you very much, Shamim. Thank you, Clelia. That says about my age, isn't it? <laughs> I have lived for a long time. Actually, uh, I was born in 1952, not on 21st February. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I will start with a story, story uh, from my father. When I was a little girl, of course I don't know anything about 1952, but all the story that I had from my father, I can tell you. And then gradually what happened my involvement, moving from place to place, because my father was a government servant, making friends in new places, and uh, you know, um, having new experience, enjoying the diverse um, festival from all sorts of religion, and all that, my uh, time of my youth, that my engagement with, you may say, it, political movement, made me who I am, and sometimes I feel like my journey is a scripture from 1952, and I'm running 72 years old, lady I am now. So this is, this is quite a lot to share with you, but I'm, as, uh, uh, it is about the storytelling, so I'll tell the story. I just remember in one of those winter that my father was waking us up, or oh, get ready. We, 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 have, um, we, we have a celebration to do, and that was uh, 14th August. We have uh, actually burnt our flag twice. <laughs> once when we were under the British rule, and once we were under Pakistan. So. I'm talking about the Pakistani flag. My father um, was, uh, was uh, it's about, uh, about Second World War. My father actually um, was um, in Assam and he was engaged with the sec Second World War, supporting the colony. And he always said to me, Shamim, we had to do it because British promised that if we help in Second World War, then they will give us freedom. Well, the freedom came for their fight in 1947, and then Pakistan was built. Pakistan was built, but British cut them into three pieces. The middle piece remained same, which is India. But the other two parts belonged to two places. They were called East Pakistan and West Pakistan. They were put together. And I would say, like in the history, when we read, it says clearly uh, that it was two nations theory. But that was wrong to say it. It wasn't two nations theory. It was the religious knife, sharp knife that cut into pieces, thinking, and it was thinking that those two parts of the land 
which is thousands of miles away from each other, would create, a, do you think it would create a good nation? Geographically, when it is miles and thousands of miles away, and we know about the people, that wherever they are, the geographical situation is vital. That makes you what you eat. That makes you what you wear. That makes you what you think. And you have your own religion in your own way. That cannot match with the other part, which is thousands of miles away. But my father fought for Pakistan's independence. So he would he used to wake us up. And we had a little space cemented. And there was a bamboo stick over there. And on the top, a Pakistani flag would, would, would be hanging there. And we, three brothers and sisters, we would sing, sing the Pakistani anthem. And he would hoist the flag. It would go on the top. And then you know we all would salute. My father was the leader. <laughs> so can you imagine? This is how I, uh, I, was, uh, I, uh, I grew up with. This is not an illusion. It is very practical to believe in Pakistan, saying this is good for us. So how did I become disillusioned and fought for the independence of Bangladesh? Actively was engaged in 1971. That is the story. It was 1948, immediately after the birth. And I'm sure all of you know that the central government of Pakistan wanted Urdu to become, only Urdu become the state language. But when you, in terms of people, majority people were living in in the, in the part which is East Pakistan. And their language is Bangla. So it was an imposition on them. And I heard that when I was born in 1952, everywhere in the chai shop, in, in offices, in the educational institutions, and in the uh, even my father's office in the break, lunch break, everybody was talking about uh, this Urdu uh, being chosen as the, as the national language. And all these people uh, throughout the whole country were very unhappy. They said, we cannot accept it. So this is the start. This is like a seed of the independence, Bangladesh independence was sown through this uh, language movement. So what happened? People didn't accept it. And like, like, you know, every country, you know, the young people, they take the lead. And young people uh, from Dhaka University, they, they wouldn't accept it. And at that time, the Dhaka University was where the medical college is. But I think everything was restricted. They couldn't do any protest. They couldn't uh, put their petition. And young people, they thought that they are not going to break this 144, which is like a restriction for any, any, any gathering or anything. They will become in four. So all of them were gathered there in, in the medical college where the uh, Amtola, they said, they, the big, big, huge, big mango, mango tree, and young men and women, they uh, they come into uh, four um, in in fours, and they said, you know, this is how we are going to moving on. All the people, all sorts of people, men, women, everyone was engaged with that. And when I said that, I just kind of feel like I have experienced it. Two front runner of that um, language movement, one who was martyr, intellectual, he was intellectual and he was killed in 1971, uh, Professor Shahid Munir Jodhuri. He was my direct teacher in Dhaka University. And when I was a little girl, I was uh, about eight years old, 
Dr. Shafia Khatun, one of the women leader who was in the forefront, I had her as my head teacher. So they were like living legends. And I've seen them, I was taught by them. So they, the police opened fire on them and you, we all are aware of it. There were uh, students, um, they were killed and it's like a wildfire. Now the whole country joined in the protest, rally, whatever they can. So when the power, if we, if we think about um, Pakistan government and the political, the politicians are politicians, you know, I mean, they are like magicians, they are like wordsmith. So what happened, like they tried to not stop it, but with their words, they were trying to um, listen to the people of uh, East Pakistan, but wasn't taking it into account to make Bengali as, I mean, as another language. Because two parts, there can be two languages there, Urdu and Bengali. But it didn't happen. On the top of it, what happened, there was attacks on the language. And the understanding is there like that at one point, the Pakistani rulers, they wanted to write Bengali in Arabic script. And Tagore's, uh, Tagore was banned. And what happened? More they are trying to deal with heavy hand, the outrage was growing even more. And especially students, they were co so conscious about it. When those four young men died and killed, something actually revealed. Number one, the utopian idea of having two parts from far, far away with a bonding, uh, only bonding is the religion is not going to work. Number two, the discrimination was evident. Number three, the people became aware of their ethnicity, their Bengaliness. And number four, they have to have the autonomy. They have to have power in their own hand. So can you see, it is the language movement. It made aware, made them aware of their position and what is, what is their right. It is, the, it is the birthright of the people from East Pakistan. So what happened? Eventually, they had to form a political group, United Front where there were people from all uh, sorts of area, including um, regardless religion and the culture. This united form said, asked, demanded to have this 21st February as a national day and a martyr's day, Shohid Dibosh. But do you think it's going to be easy for them? No because uh, immediately after that, the martial law. Um, and with the martial law, the military uh, dictator Ayub Khan came in power. It was 1958 that he came in power and they couldn't achieve the right to celebrate it for the martyrs. And as a result, what happened? I was uh, a student of A-levels in the Kumudini College in Tangail. And 
every 21st February was our platform, was our day to protest, was our um, scope to raise our voice. Every 21st February, we knew we are going to school or we are going to college, but there will be something that today we, we are not going to take part in the lesson. All we wanted to give a recognition. So what happened when I was in Kumudini College? It was a very restricted college. My father actually, it was his plan to put me inside this jail-like college. Uh, because it, I just showed some kind of political awareness from my student life. And while I was in the college, so on 21st February, we climbed the wall. It is a girls' hostel. And we all went out. Guess what? When Once we went out, but there was a Shahid Minar, and I spoke. Well, I came back, and it was inevitable. There were a few, few girls who were spotted, and I, I got expelled, expelled from the college. And I was sent back to my father. But surprisingly, my mom and, and my, my dad, none of them told me off. I thought, you know, I'm going to, going to have a very hard time. But they didn't say anything. What this did? I was in Naranganj because my father was in Naranganj. He asked one of his friends and a few friends who were teaching the college because I'm going to miss the college. And he said, Shamim is here and she can't go back to her college, but she can sit for the exam. Would you allow her to uh, do the class? And they said, OK. So as a friend's daughter, I was attending. But that is the time the uh, non-cooperation movement started growing up. So again, we were on the roads. I remember the road was called Kaide Azam Road. Now this is Bangabundhu Road. And we are raising our hand and asking and demanding to declare 21st February as a national martyr's day and a national holiday. Well, it was achieved later on. But Ayub Khan, the military dictator, he was trying to uh, handle the matter heavy-handedly. And that was the wrong thing. All that they had to do, they had to give them uh, the right to speak up in their own mother language. This non-cooperation movement ended up, took us to 1970. By this time, Bangabandhu has become the um, leader of our Milik and the representative of whole East Bengal. Even he won the majority vote in the National Assembly. Um, National Assembly was dissolved. So there wasn't any way. And in a huge, um, big rally, everybody came in to listen to him. And he said, this is the fight for independence. It was 7th of March. But the students of Dhaka University, they already hoisted a flag, which is not Pakistani flag, on 3rd March. So he knew the whole nation is behind him. And that resulted the nine months of fight, freedom movement. And I have to come again to tell you the story, how I was engaged with 1971. But I came to this country in 1990 as a teacher, primary school teacher to teach. At that time, 21st February already was a national holiday. But I thought a, al almost like 10 million people are outside the map of Bangladesh, but they're still doing something for Bangladesh. And there were two young men, Salam and Rafiq from Canada. They proposed to uh, UNESCO to make this 21st February as an international mother language day. 
together. Since then, we have this International Mother Language Day, and uh, you know, UN accepted it from, uh, I think, um, from 202 or so. We, we it is the International Mother Language Day, and uh, we celebrate it. And what does it tell to us? Respect somebody's culture. Respect somebody's language. Respect the way they are. And this International Mother Language Day, 21st February, teaches us to respect our neighbors. We are in a multilingual community here. We must know. Sometimes we compare with religion. Sometimes we compare religion with my mom, mother. So if your mother is best to you, somebody else's mother is best to them as well. Respect everybody's religion. Respect everybody's language. Then you can have a society full of harmony. Thank you very much. Thank you.